Today, households are up to their necks in stress. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, I want to do two things. First, just go over some of the recent ABS statistics relating to lending, retail and building approvals. But more importantly, doing a deep dive on our mortgage stress analysis, which of course is very relevant given the upcoming election. But first, let's start with the data from the ABS, because they said, for example, that the value of new housing loan commitments rose 1.6% to $33.3 billion in March 2022. That's season adjusted. That follows a fall of 3.5% in February after reaching a record high of $33.9 billion in January. Now, the ABS said that the value of new investor loan commitments reached a record high of $11.7 billion in March, and that was the key reason for the rise in the value of new housing loan commitments. This is important, of course, because as debt is rising, when household finances are already under pressure means more pressure. In fact, with the exception of February 2022, the value of investor loan commitments has had monthly increases since November 2020. And in March, the increases were reported for all states and territories with high proportional increases in Queensland at 6.7%, South Australia at 8.5%, Western Australia at 5.9%, the Australian Capital Territory at 14.9% and the Northern Territory at 32.4%. After falling 4.7% in February, the value of new owner-occupier loan commitments rose 0.9% to $21.6 billion in March, 22% lower than the same time last year. The rises in the value of owner-occupier loan commitments were reported in all states and territories, and the value of owner-occupier loan commitments rose for the purchase of existing dwellings purchase of newly erected dwellings and for alterations and additions, while commitments for the construction of new dwellings fell. You'll see the relevance of that in a moment. But also, following falls in January and February, the number of new loan commitments for owner-occupier first-time home buyers rose 4.2%, up 417 in March, but is still 32.8% lower than the near record high just a year ago. Reduced first home buyer lending over the past year partially reflects an unwinding of COVID-19 related incentives such as home builder, but also, of course, the significant rise in property investors. Now, if we turn to the dwelling approvals data, total dwelling approvals fell 18.5% in season adjusted terms in March. That followed a 42% rise in February according to data from the ABS. The ABS said the fall in the total number of dwellings approved in March was driven by approvals for private sector dwellings, excluding houses, which fell 29.9%. Now, the reason to underscore this is, of course, because when approvals are given for a block of flats, for example, a block of apartments, then that's a very large number of dwelling approvals. So as a result, just one block can lift the numbers dramatically or not. Therefore, the volatility of the sector other than houses means that it always wobbles all over the place. In contrast, approvals of private sector houses did also decrease, falling 3% in March, following a 14.6% rise in February. And also across Australia, the number of dwelling approvals fell in Victoria, down 34.6%, Tasmania, down 27.3%, New South Wales was down 23.9%, and South Australia was down 23.5%. That's all in season-adjusted terms. Although dwelling approvals did increase in Queensland up 12.4% and Western Australia up 5.1%. And approvals for private sector houses rose in Queensland at 
and Western Australia 0.3%, but fell in all other mainland states. In New South Wales, they were down 7.5%, Victoria down 5%, and South Australia down 2.2% in seasonally adjusted terms. And by the way, the value of building approvals fell 10.8% in March in season adjusted terms, and the value of residential buildings decreased overall 18.3%. That followed a 37.7% rise in February. The fall in total residential building values was driven by a 20.7% decrease in new residential buildings, while the result in alterations and additions was actually flat. And then the third element to put on the table here is the Australian retail turnover, which rose 1.6% in March 2022, reaching a new record level, according to the retail trade figures again released by the ABS. They said the result was up 0.8% on the previous record level set in November 2021, and this follows a 1.8% rise in February 2022, a 1.6% rise in January 2022, and a fall of 4.1% in December 2021. Rising prices, combined with continued easing of restrictions across the country, has led to rises in turnover in the three months of the March quarter. Pause there. Rising prices. In other words, the inflationary impact is coming through with higher retail turnover. But of course, that isn't necessarily positive. Consumer spending rose across both discretionary and non-discretionary industries, Following flooding in late February and early March along the East Coast, impacted businesses regained lost turnover from forced closures as consumers restocked pantries. Leading the increase across all industries was household goods retailing up 3.4%, followed by other retailing at 2%, cafes, restaurants and takeaway foods at 2%, department stores at 4.1%, food retailing at 0.5%, and clothing, footwear and personal accessory retailing at 0.5%. In fact, every state and territory saw a rise in retail sales, except for South Australia, with turnover down 0.7%. Queensland was at 3.4% and New South Wales at 1.8%, and they experienced the largest increases following the recovery from flooding and extreme rainfall in late February and early March. Turnover in Western Australia was 1.9%, and they recovered from supply chain issues last month, with rises also seen in Victoria at 0.6% and the Australian Capital Territory 1.1%, and the Northern Territory 1.9%, and Tasmania at 0.7%. So you can see three things from here. Firstly, lending has been up quite strongly, but that's mostly investors, and my suspicion is that will now tail off. Secondly, there are a number of one-off reasons why retail turnover was quite strong, partly to do with inflation and partly to do with the post-flood situation. And thirdly, when it comes to building approvals, the numbers are very volatile, but overall it doesn't look as though the momentum in building approvals is going to continue. That's all very relevant then when we come to think about mortgage stress, which is what we're going to do now. So as a segue to the mortgage stress discussion, let's look at this chart, which is a chart which has taken account of the latest RB estimates for real wages growth. And this chart from the Centre of Future Work highlights the fact that taking everything into account, real wages will actually be at March 2012 levels by June 2024. So there is absolutely no prospect of real wages growth anytime soon. And that's, of course, based on the Reserve Bank analysis that came out at the end of last week. So people should be concerned about this insofar that costs of living are racing away. Mortgage rates are going up, but there are no real wages in the pipeline. That means mortgage stress is going to go higher. And just to underscore that, this is the mortgage stress data to the end of April. And you can see there that consistent trend higher. We're at 42.6% now. That's actually the highest it's ever been. And that translates to more than 1.5 million households. And it's worth reflecting again that before COVID, stress levels were at 32.9%. So we've seen a considerable increase through the COVID episode, despite ultra low interest rates, all the government incentive schemes and everything else. Why? Because house prices have risen very strongly, mortgages have got bigger, 
and household costs are rising dramatically when incomes are not. And of course the RBA last time they reported showed that the household debt to income ratio is 186.2, it continues to rise. Of course it doesn't really give the full picture because not every household borrows, roughly one in three does. So you should really multiply that by three times to get a better feel. No wonder then that debt to income ratios of six times plus are becoming significantly more common. So here is the stress data for April 2022. And what I've done here is to highlight in yellow where the numbers have increased. In other words, stress has got higher. And that shows that mortgage stress is where a lot of the action is at the moment. Overall mortgage stress at 42.57%. It's highest in Tasmania. More than 60% of households are now under financial pressure. It's also up again in New South Wales and in Queensland and in Victoria. There was an easing back in the ACT and in the Northern Territories, and South Australia and Western Australia. But overall, mortgage stress is sitting at 1.56 million households. That's a record. We should also look at rental stress. And there have been a few movements. It's got worse in Tasmania, perhaps no surprise given the pressures there in the rental sector. But other households have reported a bit of a reduction. Now, that's partly because we're coming out of the earlier COVID episodes and people are earning more because they're working more. But it also recognises something else, and that is that a number of renters have been forced to shift into cheaper accommodation because they couldn't afford or because the rents were put up where they were previously. So whilst the actual number may be a little lower, the truth is this is actually a bit of an artificial situation. And actually, I think that the total real more rental stress number is closer to 42 or 43%. I'm going to do a separate show on that later because I think this is an important discussion. Now, if we look at investors, those are property investors. Well, in the ACT and in Victoria and Western Australia, the proportion of investors who are still not making good returns on their investment property went up slightly. But it did ease back in New South Wales, as well as Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania. So around a quarter of investors are underwater in a purely cash flow sense, or indeed are trying to sell their investment property. That's still a quite a high number, by the way. And the reason that it's eased back slightly is because many investors have put the rents up quite recently. And then if we look at financial stress overall, we see that in Tasmania, Victoria and Western Australia, the stress levels actually have gone up. If you look at the total community, overall 41% of households are in financial stress. But it's eased back slightly in the ACT, New South Wales, the Northern Territory, Queensland and South Australia, and that's mainly because of what's happened around investors and renters. Now, at this point, let me just pause and make a very clear statement about how I measure stress, because people still get confused with stress equating to 30% of gross or net income, depending on who's speaking about it. That is a figure which doesn't actually work at all well. So I don't go that route. What I do is in my surveys, my 52,000 rolling surveys, that's more than 4,000 new ones each month, I look at money in, money out. How much money is coming into the household? How much money is going out of the household? And I take account of all of the expenditure, including the mortgage or the rent, non-discretionary spending and discretionary spending, but with a focus on non-discretionary spending, things like food, electricity, petrol, and school, even things like school fees and healthcare costs. So if households are spending more on a regular basis than they're actually getting in via way of income, I put them in the stressed category. Now, they may have assets. They might even be able to put more on credit cards or pull down on the loan. But the bottom line is, if households are spending more on a continuous basis than they're receiving, they're going to get into difficulty unless they change their behaviour, which is why I think my approach is the most 
accurate and effective. OK, now let's look at the next set of data in stress land. And that is looking at stress by our household segments. Now, one of the observations I'll make is that our household segments are a very effective way at seeing how different groups of households are behaving, because not all households are behaving the same. And so we categorise these by way of both demographics and age and lifestyle and income and other factors. So it's a multifactorial piece of analysis. And this gives us a view then of the proportion of households who are in stress in each of our main extra segments. And it continues to be the case that young growing families, including many first time buyers, are the most stressed in terms of mortgage stress at 77.5%. We also see more and more on the urban fringe, both the battling urban and the disadvantaged fringe households, which are often those with lower levels of income, but also very large mortgages. And the proportion of those that are actually under stress continue to rise. In rental stress, the multicultural establishment, they're the first generation Australians, are the highest at 58%, plus young affluent households. So these are people who have quite good incomes, but are paying a larger proportion of their incomes on rentals, are also at 56.85% and therefore highly stressed. Some of the other segments, a little less so. From an investor perspective, the two segments that are the most stressed are those holding multiple investment properties and often large mortgages too. So we see our exclusive professional group and our young affluent group, both with above average incomes, both with above average portfolios of investment properties, struggling the most. And overall, our financial stress measure, which is an aggregate of mortgage stress, rental stress and investor stress based on the total household count in the particular segment, shows that the young growing families group is the most stressed at 59, nearly 60 percent, the battling urban at 54 percent and the first generation Australians, the multicultural establishment households at 51.7 percent, the others a little less stressed. And you can see there that I've broken those numbers out. So of the nearly 10 million households in Australia, more than 1.56 million are in mortgage stress, more than 2 million are in rental stress, more than 768,000 are stressed investors, and 4.3 or 41% of all households are in financial stress in other words, they have cash flow problems with their finances now, and that's at 41.05%. That's the highest it's ever been. Now, the next thing we can do is just quickly look at the top postcodes. This is mortgage stress. It's sorted by the number of households in the particular postcode. Whilst it is quite feasible to sort it by the percentage in mortgage stress, I find that the percentage figures tend to be a bit of a red herring insofar that you can have a very small number of households in a particular postcode with a very high percentage count, whereas some of the larger postcodes, the count is higher, but the percentage is lower. So I go with the number. And the postcode this month is 6065 with the highest number of mortgage stressed households, 10,420. And that includes a number of those suburbs to the north of Perth, around Tapping. Then we go to Toowoomba, the regional centre there. Very significant proportion, more than 10,000 are in mortgage stress. That's 65% of the population base who are borrowing. And then we go to Victorian postcodes, Narrawarren, Berwick, both of which are high growth suburbs on the outskirts of Melbourne. Then we go to Ballarat, another regional centre with considerable issues, 
and then more of those high growth suburbs including Pakenham and Pakenham Lower. Then we come back to New South Wales in and around Mount Annan, another high growth area. Then we go up to Queensland to postcode 4306 and that includes a number of areas in and around Pine Mountain. Then we come back to Hopper's Crossing in Victoria, postcode 3029, another high growth suburb. Then we go across to Western Australia to postcode 6030 that includes places like Tamala Park, Quinns Rock and Meriwa. Then we come back to Victorian postcode Sydenham, including Delahaye and Hillside, postcode 3037. And then we go back to Western Australia to places like North Lake, O'Connor, Sampson, Spearwood. And then back to Victoria to another high growth suburb, 3030. The point to make here is that we have significant momentum now in terms of growth in stress in those high growth areas, particularly people who've bought in relatively recently, bought in with big mortgages, often thanks to government incentives as well, very little equity in the property, their incomes are under pressure, and because they live in high growth areas with lack of infrastructure, they're spending a lot more on getting about, which means that fuel costs are also significant. But the regional centres are also very much now being caught, and again, the costs of getting about transportation as one factor, plus of course, Property values have been rising quite fast in those centres and as a result mortgages are bigger relative to income. And some of the income multiples that we see in some of these regional areas are frankly quite scary. Then I look at rental stress and postcode 3000 in the centre of Melbourne has the highest count of rental stress. And then we go up to Toowoomba for 350. And in Queensland, we see quite a few areas, including this one, where rental stress has really accelerated significantly. Then we come across to postcode 2540, which is down in the region of St George's Basin and Sanctuary Point, Sussex Inlet. That is partly still a spillover from the earlier bushfires and also the drift into the regional areas that we've seen quite recently. More than 10,000 are rentally stressed there. And then we go across to Campbelltown, postcode 2560, where more than 9,900 are still in rental stress. And then we go to Liverpool and Liverpool South, Moorbank, Warwick Farm, postcode 2170, where 9,800 are exposed. Then we go back across to WA to 6163 to Sampson, places like that. Again, high numbers. We go back up to Queensland in around Bundaberg with more than 9,400, postcode 4670. Another Queensland postcode, which may be surprising to some, is around Surface Paradise and Main Beach, postcode 4217. But that's a function of a lot of people moving up to the area and rentals rising significantly. Then we go across to postcode 2770 in and around Bidwell in New South Wales, and that includes places like Lethbridge Park, Minchinbury, Mount Druitt and Wilmot, with more than 8,600 households exposed. And then we go to postcode 2250. That, of course, is in the central coast, Gosford and areas around there with more than 8,500 and some of the sea change stuff that's gone on with very little rental property available and significantly climbing rents. Then we go to Cranbourne, postcode 3977, again another high growth corridor area. And then we go to Blacktown, postcode 2148. So it's worth understanding that we see quite a strong correlation between mortgage stress and rental stress with some differences. The most significant difference, of course, is the centre of Melbourne, where there is very little owner-occupied property there now. A lot of it is actually for investment purposes, and a lot of it is still vacant, or rentals are actually not covering the costs of those units.
Now let's just quickly look at those stressed investors. So this is the other side of the investment conundrum. Stressed investors mean that they are not getting sufficient from their rentals to cover the costs of the rental, or indeed they're trying to actively dispose of their rental property for fear of loss of capital ahead. Postcode 3141 South Yarra is the most stressed from a property investor perspective. And then we go again to Bundaberg 4670, more than 4,700 households there. Then we go over to Western Australia in places like Mandra. Unfortunately, I keep having to highlight Mandra as one of those long-term stressed areas. And whilst there have been some adjustments and some improvements, they're still near the top of the list at 6210 and more than 4,193 stressed investors. Then we go across to the centre of Melbourne. Maybe not surprising if renters have problems in 3,000, then perhaps no surprise property investors do too. Then we go up to Service Paradise, again an analogue to the stress renter. And then we come to Surrey Hills and Darlinghurst, postcode 2010 in New South Wales. And from there we go to the Campbelltown area, 2560. And then we go to Mount Druitt, Lethbridge Park, 2770. Southport up in Queensland around Labrador, 4215. Then we go to Bateau Bay, 2261, which includes areas around the entrance and the entrance north. Then we start seeing some interesting moves. For example, in places like DY, 2099, where property prices have risen strongly, but rentals are not necessarily covering those higher mortgage costs. Then we go to 4216 Paradise Point, Runaway Bay, South Stradbrook, with more than 3,000. Grey Stains, 2145, including Wentworthville and Pendle Hill, with more than 3,000. And Queensland, Little Mountain, in places like Caloundra, with more than 3,000, postcode 4551. And finally, we look at the overall financial stress. So just to be clear, financial stress is defined as an aggregate of mortgage stress, rental stress and investor stress. And it's compared with the total number of households in the postcode. Toowoomba, postcode 4350, has the highest count of households in financial stress, followed by 2770, that's around Mount Druitt, in New South Wales. Then we go to the centre of Melbourne, postcode 3000. And then we go to Cranbourne, 3977, another high growth area, of course. Then we go to Bundaberg up in Queensland, 4670. Across to North Lakes and North Coogee in Western Australia, in the area of 6163, Samson. Then we go to Victoria, postcode 3029 to Hopper's Crossing with more than 16,000. Ballarat follows on at 3350. Ipswich follows on from that, 4305. And then we go back to Derrimont Point, Cook and Werribee in Victoria, 3030, another high growth area, followed by Fountain Gate and Narrow Warren, 3805, again, another high growth area. Then we go to Blacktown in New South Wales, 2148 followed by Surface Paradise and Main Beach, 4217, followed by 3064 Craigieburn and Mickleham, with more than 13,728 households in difficulty. Then we go out to the regional area of South Tamworth, 2340, followed by Berwick and Harkaway, 3806, and West Gosford on the central coast, Postcode 2250. So there are some common themes coming through from looking at this analysis. The first is, of course, high growth suburbs, a lot of new building, a lot of new people piling in, getting big mortgages, maybe relatively recently, are the ones very much on the leading edge. But we're also seeing other areas, regional centres like Ipswich and Toowoomba, and the central coast, where perhaps older households have moved as well. And 
If you look closely, you also see a few other postcodes where more affluent people are also affected. So mortgage stress is something that appears to touch quite a few households, as does rental stress and investor stress and overall financial stress. It's a patchwork quilt, but it is getting considerably worse. And unfortunately, I don't see any mitigation coming at the moment. As I said on the way into this segment, the fact is that real wages are going nowhere and we know that interest rates are going to rise. And as those rises get translated to higher mortgages and mortgage repayments, that's going to put more people under financial pressure. Now, I just wanted to share one more slide, and that is looking at the various federal electorates. We do actually align our data now to the federal electorates. And it's interesting that the highest mortgage stress reads are in the number of ALP seats like Werriwa and MacArthur in New South Wales. WA electorate of Pearce, currently Liberal, is also highly stressed. That may be one reason why it could switch. Then Franklin and Chifley, McEwen. And it's interesting to me that in the top 20 or so postcodes, the bulk of them are actually ALP. I wonder why it is that we have heard very little from the ALP about mortgage stress and how to mitigate it. That is, for me, a very significant missing policy. It should be there, but it's not. Now, let's move on and just remind you that the mortgage rate rises are going to be a significant problem. And I just want to go over these charts once again. If you have a 1.99% mortgage for every $100,000 over a 30-year period, your interest and principal repayment would be $365 a month. If the rate went up by 1% to 3%, that's a 15.6% increase in your monthly repayment. It's $422, according to the CPA calculator. And if it went up 2% to 4%, that's a 31% increase. So for every $100,000 you borrow, that's an additional $478 per month. And the point I want to make about this is that these are big movements. So whilst the interest rate may be up 1% or 2%, the actual monthly repayment is a multiple of that. Why? Because you have to pay so much more because interest rates have been so low. And the other observation I would have that many households who are in mortgage stress are not those who hold savings buffers. Many of those who are stressed are living hand to mouth. And in some cases, it will be just a few weeks before the rises would tip them over the edge. So there are a lot of precarious households there at the moment. And just to give you an idea of that, I've run some rate sensitivities. So if the mortgage rates went up another 0.5%, there's around another 143,000 households who would drop into mortgage stress, in my definition. If it went up 1%, then there will be an additional 178,000 in addition to the 143,000 who would get hit. And if it went up another couple of percent, we're seeing totals close to four to 500,000 additional households that would get into difficulty. The point here is we have a lot of people right on the edge. And the problem that I see with rates going up over the next few months is that this is going to put more and more pressure on households. Remember that incomes are not rising, cost of living are dramatically, the inflation rates more than 5.1%, and non-discretionary inflation is at 6.6% at the moment. These are big numbers. No reason to expect them to reverse for any time soon, which means, of course, that we're going to have more people falling into mortgage stress ahead. And mortgage stress is one of those things that doesn't necessarily cause immediate disaster but it's like a slow dripping tap. Unless you do something about it, the tap continues to deteriorate. The pressure gets worse and ultimately you have to do something perhaps more extreme, like replace the washer. Now, the point about this is that there are many households who are now living on the edge 
or close to the edge, and yet interest rates are yet to translate to higher repayments. This, in my view, is a traffic accident, a slow-moving traffic accident, but one which is nevertheless coming along. And by the way, it's worth reflecting on this. People are now starting to talk about high price slides. So the old negative equity problem also may rear its head too. Now, one other thing we should talk about before I finish is to look at my stress mapping. And this, of course, is a graphical representation of the mortgage stress counts by postcode. Now, I could do it by percentage, as I discussed earlier, but I do think the numbers tell the story better. So here is the map for the Sydney region. And we're looking here at mortgage stressed households. And we can see there that there are a few hot spots in and around the city, but by far the hardest hit areas are places like Campbelltown, Chipping Norton, Liverpool, and then up towards Blacktown and places like that. Western Sydney is definitely where some of the pain is. But if we pull out, we can see that the story continues to develop in that band north and south, Western Sydney with Blacktown through to Campbelltown. So here is the area now around Melbourne. And you can see there that Berwick, Harkaway and places like that, postcode 3806 and 3805 is where the hotspots really are. But we also have hotspots to the north, Craigie, Burn and Mickleham, and also, of course, down Point Cookway. And as you zoom in towards the centre of Melbourne, again, there's a bit of a patchwork story with some postcodes considerably worse than others. Now, this is the story of Brisbane and the surrounding area. And uh, once again, you can see that there are a number of hotspots, particularly to the west of Brisbane around Ipswich, as well as to the north of Brisbane. Closer in, things are not so bad. Although even there, there are some postcodes like 4152, where the relative count is somewhat higher. And of course, the overall population of Brisbane is lower than Sydney or Melbourne. So when you start seeing orange and red areas, that's potentially a problem. If I jump across to Adelaide and the surrounding areas, again, the story is a little similar. Some areas OK, but areas north of Adelaide 5108 around Salisbury, for example, is a particular hotspot. And we also see some areas to the south where there are some issues. And also Mount Barker is another significant problem area too. So jumping across to Perth, we can see that in and around Perth itself, things are not too bad, although there are a small number of postcodes with some degree of difficulty. But if you go north or south of Perth, particularly on the strip of land close to the coast, you can see quite a lot of pressure. And Wanneroo 6065 is where the epicenter actually is. And if you pull out, you can see how the story develops with continued pressure right up as far as Clarkson 6030 and down significantly beyond Hamilton Hill. I'd also make the point that areas around the Vines and Ellenbrook is another considerable area where we're starting to see some pressure. And that's true also to some other areas further inland to the south as well. Now, we might just jump down to Tasmania because, of course, the total population is a lot lower there. But nevertheless, you can see once again that there are some hotspots, particularly up here around 7011 and 7010. And there is a bit of a story here insofar that we know that house prices have risen dramatically 
in and around a number of Tasmanian areas, whereas incomes have hardly risen at all and costs are rising. So the pincer movement is extremely strong, which is why, in fact, Tasmania has the highest mortgage stress count in the country. And this is a story of Darwin, which shows that there are some pockets of stress. Again, the counts are relatively low. And here is the ACT, which shows that, again, there are areas doing very well, but there are also some areas where there is more pressure building, particularly areas to the west of the ACT. Now, I thought I'd just show you one other set of charts before I finish today, and that is my incremental stress analysis. So I do model the sensitivity of households to potential further growth in mortgage stress based on interest rate movements. And I model 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, and 3% increases. And this map shows the consolidated additional number of households that would fall into stress if, in fact, mortgage rates were 3% higher. It's just a theoretical model, but it is actually quite useful when it comes to trying to understand what's going on. So here is the one for Melbourne. And the point I'd like to make is that the areas where stress is already highest, so places around Cranbourne, places around Point Cook, and places around Mickleham, are all where the stress is going to get worse. Perhaps no surprise, but I'd also make the point that some of those areas that were doing relatively well earlier on also get tipped over too. So it's not just a question of further counts of household stress in the same postcodes. In fact, other postcodes drop into the problem areas too. And if indeed interest rates would have got 3%, remember I showed earlier on, that's a considerable increase in monthly repayments. That's enough to put a lot of people in difficulty. And a similar analysis for Sydney shows that a lot of the pressure is up in northwestern Sydney from Grey Stains up toward Beaumont Hills and Kellyville. Now, those are areas, again, of a lot of high growth recently and, of course, a lot of people who've bought recently. So a lot of those are now being sucked in. The proportion of additional households in places like Blacktown or indeed Campbelltown is a little lower. So once again, what we find is that the incremental stress spills out into other postcodes, but with the concentration on those who have been newly purchased, high growth suburbs, big mortgages and significant incremental costs in travelling because of lack of infrastructure. So there is a pattern that I think builds. Now, I don't have time in this show to go through all of the mapping that I've done. But if you would like me to go into rental stress or financial stress or other maps, leave a comment. And if there's enough interest, I'll perhaps make another show specifically on the detail of the mapping and how it plays out. But there's enough here to give you a flavour. Now, before I finish, just a quick update of our scenarios. I've had to make some significant changes because of what the Reserve Bank did last week. And these scenarios are just indicators of what may play out. They're not predictions. They're not estimates. They're just my musings based on my model as to what may happen. And firstly, we've changed the RBA baseline. I now think that over the next couple of years, they're looking at a cash rate of perhaps 2.5%. And the unemployment rate, they're saying about 3.75% is a low point. It might be slightly higher, but that's what they're saying. I think that means mortgage rates will be around 5.5%. As a result of that, mortgage stress will sit around 44%. The losses will be higher than previously estimated because of the higher mortgage rate. And very importantly, home prices will likely slide somewhere between 15 and 25 percent over that two year period. What they're doing is lifting rates and ending the quantitative easing. And that's probably got about a 10 percent chance of being right. The best case scenario is the Reserve Bank doesn't lift rates so strongly to 1.5 percent. And the reason for that is because the Momentum in the economy eases back considerably. In fact, unemployment would probably go higher again, perhaps to more than 4%. The mortgage rate would not be so high, 
mortgage stress will be a little higher, the losses will be a little higher. But there is still here with the lower rate a chance that home prices could be a little higher than they are today, but they're more likely to be somewhat lower. And we'd also see lots of additional incentives to try and pull people into the market and also term funding facility version two. In other words, cheap money to the banks so they can lend more. I think that's the most likely scenario we're going to see. The third scenario is that, in fact, the RBA has to cut rates again because the lift of rates creates a crater in growth and essentially we have to reverse course. And if they did reverse course, they'd have to take rates pretty much back to where they were. That would have a significant impact, though, on unemployment. So it would likely rise before it falls again later, possibly. Mortgage rates would stay low. The mortgage stress levels would be a little lower because of it. The losses would be a little higher. But home prices would still likely fall somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, depending on where they were and what type they were. And we'd see more quantitative easing, more fiscal stimulus and maybe even negative interest rates. I think there's a 25 percent chance that could happen. And then beyond that, there is still the risk of a multi-wave disruption that could be created by more COVID. It could be created by the conflict internationally and rates will go even lower. If that nightmare scenario happened, we'd see much higher unemployment, much lower mortgage rates, significant mortgage stress, higher mortgage, higher bank losses and home prices dropping even more. And there would be potentially bail-in and bail-outs and quantitative easing and a lot of other nonsense going on as well. I give that about a 15% chance, not very likely, but that's probably a worst case scenario. As I say, best case is that we don't see the RBA taking rates so high. As a result of that, the price movements are less extreme there. But with mortgage stress being very strong and with mortgage rates of around 5%, households will still be under considerable pressure. And that, I guess, takes me to my final point here is mortgage stress is becoming a thing more households are getting caught up in it. And a lot of households still don't recognise that they've got cash flow issues. Now, they can put more on credit cards, they can refinance, perhaps even pull on deposits if they've got savings. But eventually, unless they change the ratio of what they spend versus the income coming in, they're going to get into difficulty. So I always make these points. Firstly, it's worth drawing by cash flow so you can see where the money's going and where it's coming and prioritise where you're spending. Secondly, if you do have issues, you should be talking to your bank early, particularly if you have a mortgage. They have hardship schemes which may help. Thirdly, I don't necessarily think that refinancing or drawing down equity is necessarily a very smart strategy unless you change your behaviour. And unfortunately, a lot of people are locked into this high debt environment. Remember, interest rates are going higher. Debt is going to cost a lot more. So actually getting rid of debt rather than actually getting more debt is important. And the last observation is chances are house prices will slide from here rather than go further. More people are starting to suggest that now. So people need to be cautious if they're making commitments now because essentially they could be buying at the top of the market when rates are as low as they've ever been and yet are going to rise. So this is a time for caution, making sure you've got lots of buffers and making sure that you don't get caught. I hope that's been of some use. I will update the modelling next month and uh, once again walk you through it. And by the way, if you'd like a particular discussion about a particular suburb, we still are running our one-to-one -one service. That means that we can have a discussion in detail about the dynamics of a particular suburb using my mortgage stress analysis and other dynamics. And perhaps suggest how things may play out. If you're interested in that conversation, feel free to reach for me. You can send me an email or use the app on my blog to contact me. And by the way, I'm planning six to eight weeks ahead all the time with this because there are so many people who are quite interested in having a more detailed one-on-one -on -one conversation. Or indeed, you can subscribe via Patreon to get the full monthly update of my postcode analysis, which includes information about which postcodes are behaving under stress, and indeed some thoughts about where price dynamics may go at a suburban postcode level.
So go to Patreon if you'd like more information there. Anyway, bottom line is this. We are at a very important inflection point now with rates rising, with incomes in real terms going backwards, with pressure on households beginning to rise, with inflation being so strong, and mortgage stress will continue to go higher. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge, and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.